Welcome everyone to the Neo Reality Collective. I am your host, Neo Reality Eric. Eric, and everything, everything in battle before my ultimate wisdom of pop culture news talk. As we go ahead in depth uh, of 25 episodes in, and we don't have that much news today, but it is a Wednesday, which means we got our weekly dose of comics. Yeah! Third Eye Comics. So... Not that much news broke out for me to check to cover, but uh, there are some big factors. One of which is what was the original plan for the WWE Universal title at Hell in a Cell. So, <clears throat> so, oh, following class of champions, Roman Reigns offered Jay Uso a rematch at Hell in a Cell as part of his quest to be recognized as the Tribal Chief. Of the WWE and the annoying fan of the uh, Hawaiian family, I'm pretty sure I butchered that right wrong. Do not sucker punch me, Roman. And and the and the, now the cousins will go one on one inside the structure with an I quit stipulation involved. Jey Uso revealed during a recent appearance on Cheap Heat with Peter Rosenberg, Rosenberg, that the feud was originally scheduled to conclude at Clash of Champions, and he was only supposed to get rope to get Roman to the next homie. Doug Day ultimately decided to prolong the feud because of how popular it was. The company's original plan has seemingly been revealed. Paul Davis of WrestlingNews.co reported that Doug Day was originally going to have the Universal title be defended inside the structure against... him. Yeah, The Fiend. So... Here's the thing. This does re this relate to the whole wobbly walrus thing that they were going to tie it in with. But I honestly don't feel like they should have... I'm glad they thought, okay, let's not do that story yet. I'm hoping, emphasis on hoping, that the plan is to move forward with, with The Fiend and, and Roman Reigns down the road after Royal Rumble. I, I kind of want to see... Like, I had two ideas of what they could have done with this. They could have extended the feud with Jey Uso, but because of the so much complex history... Okay, I'm not going to say complex. Okay, that okay, that, that we now with complex. Okay, let's, let's not go that deep. But considering the intense feuds that both Roman, Uso, and even Bray Wyatt have had over the last few months, heck, the last few years... I had advocated that this sh that in order to make Hell in a Cell matter again, part of my quest for Hell in a Cell to matter again. And not the pay-per-view, because that's stupid. No, no, no. It should be, we need this match to mean something again. Bloody, intense, violent, destructive, and all and all, all about endgame for personal vendetic, vindic, vindictive feuds. And I had advocated... That it should be the return, the second six-man Hell in a Cell match for the WWE Universal Championship. And I advocate that it should be Roman Reigns defending it against Jey Uso, against Sheamus, against The Fiend, against Braun Strowman, against Daniel Bryan. And, and let's see, uh, who was the sixth guy? I, uh, if I already said the sixth guy... Right, let me just double check, but part of my quest to make Hell in a Cell matter again. It's my big initiative. Okay, it's not really a big initiative. It's just me saying, I feel like this should be the plan for Hell in a Cell. Not, let's just go ahead and just make Hell in a Cell a gimmick pay-per-view because we can. But, um, yeah, it's annoying how much Hell in a Cell has not mattered in recent years. Like, Hell in a Cell was meant to be the end game of feuds. It was supposed to be the end of a lot of things, and yet now that he wants to turn it to a freaking and gimmick because that sells, but there, but Vince doesn't seem to know why it sold, and yeah, it's just annoying. <clears throat> It's just annoying how things have gotten with that, but I have advocated that Hell in a Cell needs to matter again, and that I felt like a six-man and Armageddon Hell in a Cell match should be the best option. So, and and then, like, afterwards, um, after I made that post, I thought, okay, if they don't do that, then we'll sell for the Jimmy, for the Uso Reigns match. 
Though, I will still say that if you want to make this fight really, if you want to make Hell in Cell matter again, you need to have all the tools to make it vindictive and, and violent and grotesquely. Like, the last time Hell in Cell mattered to me, in my opinion, was Roman Reigns and Bray Wyatt. That was a five-month feud that conveniently, coincidentally fell on October. So, yeah, I, I did feel like that was the best place to... Do I that was like the last time I felt like Hell in a Cell actually, you know, mattered. So, I, yeah, that, that's kind of convenient, isn't it? And it would have mattered here more because it's it's Roman and Wyatt. They are the guys I see being the future big top heels of the WWE, face and heel of the WWE. How their feud could be what could be our era's version of Austin and Rock. I mean, not in terms of box office draw or star power, but like in terms of what could be brought to the table. I'm not that insane like Triple H said, but yeah, I do feel like we should start, if The Rock's not going to come to WrestleMania and fight Roman Reigns, I feel like it's either going to be Big E Langston or, or The Fiend Bray Wyatt going one-on-one -on -one against Roman Reigns. So we'll have to see where that goes. Meanwhile, WWE has filed trademarks for stupid, 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 oh my god, why are you trying to take people's independence? Oh, and they also, uh, they also took, uh, Saturday, Saturday Morning Slam. In fact, does anyone even remember that show? Like, it was so, like, I forgot that show even existed for a time. I was thinking, wait, what was Saturday Morning Slam? When I first heard this, I was like, what's that again? Like, that was a thing? Is this, like, a cartoon? And then I found out it was a WWE G-rated show. Just when I thought the era couldn't get any worse. And they did stupid cartoonish stuff. Very cartoonish stuff. With Daniel Bryan involved. And Nick Foley was the, was the GM of the brand. And I was like... Like, I can't make Foley's the lovable oaf that we all like to hang out with, but... He's the freaking hardcore legend for a reason. So, yeah, Dodo has apparently trademarked that. I thought for sure they already trademarked that. Like, and this was a renewal when I first heard this. But apparently not. They also trademarked Astani, uh, Ast Astin and uh, Adis, uh, Adonis, Desmond Troy, Skull, Cre Skull King, which was the nickname given to Triple H. While well, Saturday Morning Slam was was a short-lived CW series that ran from 2020, 2012 to 2013. Uh, Flash Morgan Webster, so you know if he ever leaves WWE, that means he would have to start from scratch completely. Ija Dragovo, whatever. Isla Dawn, Jack Stars, and Saturday Morning Slam. So, I heard this and I was like... Why, though? Why? Like, I'm still saying that wrestlers should fight for their independent names that they build themselves up with and whatnot, but... Yeah, uh... Yeah, there was also reports going around about Andrade Cien Almas about why he didn't get drafted, including Mickey James. In fact, they were announced that he was the only free agents left from the 2020 draft. So, nice to know where their, lot, where their spots lie. However, Wrestling Inc. has learned that Andrade Cien Olmes hasn't been drafted because he's undergoing a minor elective procedure. He's expected to be out of action for about a month. According to a source familiar with the situation, he's expected to receive a push when he returns. Mickey James is out of action because of a broken nose, although that hasn't been confirmed why that she hasn't been drafted. But Andrade Cien Olmes has been making tweets indicating he's not intending to go back to Raw or SmackDown. He is intending to go NXT. Yeah, and if he continues... So, once again, NXT is now becoming this haven for the wrestlers to be more independent. Though, I feel like once they go back to NXT after being so gone from it, I think they'll say, this doesn't feel like the NXT I remember it being. When we had our own things, when we were doing what we want, now we're just being assigned to cripple another company and give out matches that really shouldn't happen or we rush it too soon. 
Yeah, that's the... Okay, so here's the thing. When AEW does these big quality matches for shows, there's usually a very multi-week, multi-month build-up to them. Especially with pay reviews being lacking on that front. And NXT has the same same thing. But the problem is that NXT rushes it. I feel like NXT rushed it. The biggest example was the Iron Man match. The Fatal 4-Way Iron Man match. Because I felt that they should have they they should have waited till takeover to do that big match. It would have sold out. If if this if arenas was still around, if fans could still go to the shows before the virus struck and ruined all our lives, uh, it, it would have it would have really put butts in seats. Four of the best of NXT's alumni going at it and taking on for the biggest prize in the industry. Well, in people's opinion, regarding when it comes to WWE titles, because really, when you think about it, how many times, um, like, did anyone care about the Universal title until Roman got it and The Fiend had lost it to Goldberg? And then before that, no one really cared. Steph was doing all right with it. Then he ruined his own reputation because he's insane. And, and then before that, it was Brock Lesnar again. Then before that, it was Goldberg. Oh, God damn it. I don't want to be remember, reminded of those. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but, like, that, that's my biggest gripe with NXT. Uh, is that NXT feels like they can do all these great matches, but they're just rushing it. They're rushing it to market because we got to get that range pop, bro. When, as the, when they were on the network, they just did their own thing. But they're so desperate to get pop because uh, we got to fight AEW. AEW is a threat to my industry control. Even though... Yeah. Like, here's the thing. I'm all for counter-programming to some extent if it benefits everyone involved and actually ups their game. But when you rush it and rush it and rush it to market... It's not going to. It's not going to make people care. Like they'll know it's a good match. It's a great dream match they want to see, or a high stakes matchup. But if there's no story involved. Why should I care? Like yeah, they'll say, well, it's still a great match and whatnot, and, and like, and like they'll probably say, oh well, they can build off the old continuity. They can use that. Like okay, I get that part, but at the same time, it's like. Bray Wyatt's Revenge Saga works well because not only does it build off of old continuity, in fact, that's the biggest plus for it, but it actually expands upon it, I felt like. Like, Bray Wyatt doesn't explicitly say, you tried to destroy me, or some bullshit like that. He just tells everyone, remember when Seth Rollins was a scumbag, and then I turned him back into a scumbag who thinks he has a messiah complex and thinks he's God? And tries to look like Joseph Seed from Far Cry 5. Remember when I did that? So yeah. Uh, I, I have no idea where I was going with that. But Andre, Andre C. and Almas, he might be going back to NXT. We'll see in a month from now. But yeah. So AEW, Cody Rose gave an interview that people have been saying that many have wondered if AEW would ever explore running a joint promoted show similar to what Cody and the Young Bucks did with the with the classic event. Are you all in? This is great. This is where. Hey, and everything. Which featured ROH, New, J New Japan Pro Wrestling, and the National Wrestling Alliance, and was promoted weekly on ROH. While All In was an undeniable success. Um, New American Nightmare believes that he does not see a similar joint promoter show in AEW's future. Bull! I see it happening one day. Or at least a show where, well, at the same time, everyone wants to see AEW partner with, with New Japan and, and, and NWA, so I feel like it's inevitability more than a, it's never gonna, it, I doubt it. So this is what he said. I think you'll never see a full-scale, like, joint promoted show between AEW and another promotion. We have too much pride in our individual brand, but in terms of the relationships, we're never closing the door and we're never going to pull up the bridges. Oh, don't worry. 
you burn the bridge with fans. Like you burn, like you destroy the throne, the weekly shots you do on being the elite, and occasionally on the TV show. I'm pretty sure Vince is still pissed. Like, granted, he's not going to say he's pissed because that would mean he, that all the fanatics will lose their minds at the mere idea that their beloved savior of wrestling is going mad. So some assume that because of AEW's individuality, they do not have working relationships with other promotions. However, Cody says it's quite the opposite. I laugh when I hear people talking about working relationship with New Japan because clearly it already exists. John Moxley has been in New Japan. Chris Jericho has been in New Japan. It already exists. The working relationship. Okay, okay. So, here's the thing. When Okay, so there's a difference between... In John Moxley, Jericho, and what I was hearing that Brody Lee and Miro have contracts to work in New Japan. There's just one teeny tiny problem. How many of the New Japan wrestlers are showing up on, on AEW television? None. Okay, Hiroshi Tanahashi did show up on in a video on satellite. So, okay, you could count that if you want, but like, no. Unless you have, like, at least with NWA, uh, you got like, like, like NWA, at least I could believe that's more of a working relationship because, you know, Thunder Rose is showing up on Dynamite with the title. And the only reason you haven't seen an AEW guy show up on NWA's program is because they don't have any programming right now because power is still in reconstruction mode. So, Cody continues saying this. The NWA owner, Billy Corgan, and Tony Khan are in contact. Thunder Rosa is the prime example of that. I love seeing Tanahashi on TV last week. He said that I really wanted to get in the ring with one time as far as singles and never got the opportunity. And who knows? That might be something we, that can happen in the future. But our doors are open. Our, bridge are down, our bridges are down. AEW has their fair share of pre-established stars on the roster, but they've also given a national platform to dozens of independent standouts like Orange Cassidy, Private Party, It's time to a private party, but you are all invited! And Darby Allin. Oh, wait, um, uh, no! AEW is WWE light! They only have WWE talent, except WWE could be called the New Japan light! Actually, that would actually be a marked improvement to their style. I hope, but, but, but WWE, it's the be all end all! And it's like, then why are they buying out all these talents from New Japan, ROH, Impact? All the talent they make, and yet, and how many homegrown talent do you hear about that is not Roman Reigns or Bray Wyatt? Um, maybe The Miz, yeah. So yeah, maybe The Miz. Yeah, The Miz could be one. So, so congratulations, Vince. Congratulations. You can name three top-tier pet talent and stars on the entire homegrown roster of WWE, compared to the dozens upon dozens upon dozens of local of the independent Japan and Japan-based wrestling teams, there you go. There you go. So this is what was said. Um, while many ind indie stars are rebranded once they make it to the global stage the tnt champion and says altering their personalities would be insulting to the independent scene oh god vince is probably triggered now if we took someone who was playing for the v vfw's bingo halls pal centers even some of those larger skill promotions and change their character it would be doing a disservice to the fandom they've already built i'm like i totally get that reasoning like i i would i'm the proponent that the wrestlers should maintain who they are like you hire these guys because they were making ain't doing all this when you call them up you're like nah we don't want them to be like this they need to be like what we want them to be we'll buy we'll we'll they'll put butts in seats because they are face value but then when the characters are not the characters that fans grew up with grew grew into with it's kind of redundant at that point so yeah, I, I totally get what Cody's trying to go for here. So, yeah, totally get it. 
Rumor is that Disney Plus is developing a Mandalorian spinoff series for Cara Dune. So, um, according to a tweet known as Corey Van Dyke and LRM, LRM Online, Cara Dune getting her own Disney Plus series? Question mark. And then Car Corey Van Dyke says, We could definitely back this up. It's something we've heard of some of our sources a while back. Car will probably have a little help from some friends in this series, though. Ah, so she's putting a team together. Gotcha. So, yeah, th this is what I was... This is part of those series of rumors I was hearing, hearing a few months back when there was word going around that Ahsoka was coming, that all that season two seems to be more like the cusp of building off several separate spinoffs. One focusing on a live-action Ahsoka, which would be awesome. Another focusing on on uh, Boba Fett and all this other stuff. But also how they said that, that Mandalorian could theoretically be reverse engineered into a movie. So, uh, And then there's also the Bo-Katan talk. Like, maybe her, if it's really coming, if she's somehow still alive, even after she doesn't have the dark saber anymore, and the fact that they confirmed that the Mandalorians were all viciously slaughtered by the Empire. It's Disney just digging, digging, digging. Warner Brothers is developing a DC project. Yay! Of the animal powered vixen. In the lead for a possible HBO Max debut. So, yeah, according to the GD GWW, yeah, that's what it's called, War Brothers is an early development on a DC Extended Universe film project with Nixon as the lead character. However, the film may end up on, on HBO Max due to the current slate of DC films being delayed due to the virus. An additional source claims that D Warner Bros. is looking to replicate the success of Marvel Studios' Black Panther, believing Vixen can have a similar impact. So, Vixen, the character created by Gary Conway and Bob Oscar, Isker, uh, Vixen debated in Action Comics 521 and 1981. The character possesses the Tantu Totem, which was passed down from generation to generation by her ancestors, and allows her to harness the, the, harness the spirits and abilities of animals. Vixens has served on several incarnations of the Justice League, including Justice League Detroit and Justice League International. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. Though, at the same time, it's like, oh, she also showed up in the Justice League Animated Unlimited series. And was portrayed Vixen in an animated miniseries and really reprised the role for live action by an arrow and playing her grandmother and playing in Legends of Tomorrow. So... Yeah, 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 I'm all for Vixen. Like, she looks like a pretty cool character. I haven't really, like, seen much of Vixen's character, so I can't make a final opinion on that. But I'm all for it, especially if we're going more for the risque. But the idea of saying, we want to challenge Black Panther and be the impact that Black Panther was, it's like... <sighs> That's... Kind of not have a good motive. Like, I get competitions there, but, like... Dude. It... Chadwick just died, man. Yeah. Okay. So... Okay, so... There was a cameo... By Adam Sandler, where in Hubby Halloween teased an Adam Sandler crossover, and <laughs> the Sandler verse say no to a future Sandler verse crossover. What? Um, excuse me, did, did you just say a Sandlerverse crossover? Okay. Okay, um. What? So, there's a chance we're going to see Jack and Jill back as a potential crossover? In fact, wait, 
That's what I think about it. How would a crossover like that even work? If they're all the same actor? Like, that would be the weirdest case of events that ever happened. But yeah, some of Sandler's love interests have were showing up in here. Like, uh... Yeah, many of Sandler's previous characters were brought back to reference the actor's past. The main character, Hubie Dobis... Is a re dubious is re a reference to Sandler's role as a footballer, Bobby Boucher, in 1998's The Waterboy. The, his former love interest, the Violent Valentine, is also in love to many Sandler's past romantic cinematic romances. Each of their love interests, interests including Veronica Vogue uh, in 1995's Billy Madison, Veronica Bennett in Happy Gilmore, Vicky Valcourt in The Waterboy, and Valerie Verin and and in 2000's Little Nicky, all have devil V initials. <sighs> so, and there's also a the red-headed bully in Hubie Halloween named Andy Do O'Dell o o Doyle, who is most likely a descendant of, of the O'Doyle Rules family in Billy Madsen. Fans came and spot flying bags of oh god dog poop, a signature move of Sandler's path characters. Oh god. Okay, no, no, I'm not going to go into this. So, um, Phasmophobia is blowing up on Steam and Twitch. A cooperative horror game is about hunting ghosts. It's one of the most played and most watched gate streets on Steam and Twitch this month. UK-based studios Kinetic Games. I'm pretty sure that caused flashbacks to those who played the Kinect. Actually, and I never played it, used it, so I never got one. Anyways, uh, yeah, um, so Kenda Games, which is made up of only one person, okay, that that's impressive. We've launched the game into early access on September 18th. It has more than 70,000 people playing on Steam and nearly 150,000 watching on Twitch only a month later. So Phasmophobia is all about ghost hunting. It puts you and three of your friends into one of several maps where you use different tools like cameras, EMF radio sensors, to find evidence of the paranormal. It's a mixture of tension, horror, and puzzle solving. The charm, just like Among Us, comes from communication. It has direction and location-based audio, so you can only hear things around you. You can still communicate with your friends using the radio. The ghost also responds to their name being called among other audio cues, making for some hilarious and terrifying situation. So it's an independent game hit. So props, I'll give it props. One person managed to make a big hit in 2020 with in the independent gaming market. Pretty cool, pretty cool, man. So there is going to be a return. It's been seven long years since we've last seen them. The Showtime drama Dexter. About a forensic scientist who seriously who serially murders all his problems away, Bad Hour is a series finale after eight seasons, and after seven long years is long enough runway for the curse to rise on to a newly announced limited series revival. According to a release set up by TV network Michael C. Hall and showrunner Clyde Phillips, are reteaming for a ten episode old return that is due to begin production in early 2021 and set to premiere sometime next fall. Dexter is special is a special series, both for its millions of fans and how far out Showtime, as this breakthrough show helped our, put our network on the map many years ago. Gary Levin and Showtime's co-entertainment president, we could we would only want to revisit this unique character and we could find a career way to talk talk take that was trustworthy of the brilliant original series. Well, I'm happy to report that the team have found it, and we can't wait to shoot it and show it to the world. Despite this stated eagerness, the release contains no details on what the new creative take will be, but seeing how, spoiler alert, the series wrapped up with Dexter faking his own death and living under a new name in Oregon, while his sister was in, in a coma and his son Harrison was sent to live with an ex, it's safe to say Dexter has a few more than a few unresolved issues. Ah, so that's depressing. So, yeah, for those who watch Dexter, look forward to that, everyone. Um... Stay tuned for your limited series run, and let's see how this all ends. The Matrix 4, Jessica Henwick, has hinted at what fans can expect of the much-anticipated movie sci-fi sequel. And 
Yeah, once again, we're in that whole, if we build our own hype up with this, it's a recipe for disaster if we suck at it. But they don't listen, so they are saying that Jessica Henwick said that the movie will change the industry again. And explaining how director Lana Wachowski is using pioneering technology in the same way she did in 1999, which she helmed the first Matrix with Sister Lily. There are definitely moments on here where y Yana, uh, I can't pronounce her name, and I look at each other and we just go, Matrix 4. Those pinch me moments, Lana is doing something really interesting and things on a technical level the same way that you know she created this style back then. I think she's going to change the industry again with this film. There's some camera rigs that I've never seen before that we're using. That's probably all I can say for now. So, no idea what the story is and whatnot, but the two new characters are Jessica Hanwick and Abdul Mantens II's new characters are unknown. They will join main stars Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss as who reprise the role as Neil Infinity. Additionally, Jada P Pinkett Smith, who will, p who will play Nobi from the second and third films. Okay, yeah. Sadly, Lawrence Fishburne and Hugh Weaving, like I've mentioned, who played Morpheus and Agent Smith respectively, are not coming back. However, uh, Fishburne also confirmed he won't be back, saying he has not been invited to play Morpheus again, while Hugo Weaving revealed that he originally offered a part of the movie, but scheduling conflicts meant he couldn't do it. No! Well, considering what happened, this was in January, I'm pretty sure they could change things around if they wanted to. But, uh, yeah. Sucks, yeah, yeah. So Take Two has officially come out and announced that Rockstar's acquisition of Ruffian Games and the studio's rebranding at Rockstar Dundee, a reference to Ruffian being located in Dundee, Scotland. The price was not shared, not was there any official word on what exactly the studio will be working on. We are incredibly excited to, enjoy, to be joining the Rockstar team, Ruffian co-founder Billy Thompson said. Not only do, do we have the opportunity to work with some of the most successful entertainment properties in the world, but Rockstar's investment in our studio is a great sign for continued expansion of game development here in Scotland. Yes, yes, yes. So this confirms what was being rumored, even though I don't know why this had to be kept secret, because I don't really, because I, I didn't even know Ruffian Games was still a thing, honestly. I honestly forgot about them. Uh, Mass Effect, the Legendary Edition rumor, is now getting inching closer to launch after a rating surface. So, it was revealed, EA, while have not officially announced it, and rumored only, it has been popping up and popping up in Rumorville. However, the Gaming Rating Administration Committee in Korea, of Korea have published a rating for the Mass Effect Legendary Edition, which is supposedly the name of the current generation remaster that is in development that will include 1 through 3. The listing doesn't feature any new details about the project, just as the growing stack of seemingly credible information surrounding the collection of the Sh original Shepard trilogy. So, recent rumors suggested that it has slipped to a 2021 release after previously being planned for holiday 2020. Considering EA has yet to announce it, that's tough. It's that's tough to confirm, but the publisher isn't a stranger to announcing remasters close to their release. The month, this month, the remaster of Need for Speed Hot Pursuit was revealed with the game launching on November 6th. And with Mass Effect's annual and seven day happening on November 7th, it could be a good time for a reveal, so I expect that. And yeah, I'm excited for that theory. Microsoft hires Last of Us 2 developer for its new Xbox studio. Microsoft Santa Monica studio continues to add to its massive roster, Lorian Garcia. So happy to announce that this week I have joined the Microsoft's The Initiative. This is an incredible team working on something truly special. It was so hard to be left behind my friends at Naughty Dog, but I need to say thank you to Xbox and Xbox P3, P3 Twitter account to allow me to be part of the Xbox family. So, yeah, uh... Oh man, it, it's kind of awesome to hear the first game has not been announced yet, but that, but I've been here, but with all this type of all these big de time developers, like Lorian Garcia, who was the char character shading technical director on Last of Us Two, who is now working on the initiative as senior shader technologies developer. So, yeah, like, Gray, your opinions on the game are your own, but the shading was pretty good, but. So. So the color details and shading and lighting and everything was pretty good. But I digress. I'm looking forward to what the initiative has to offer since this is supposed to be part of this big plan by Microsoft. Last but not least, Xbox user interface update is out now, a month before the Xbox Series X and S launch. 
So this is the home screen that every Xbox will use. So it was announced, Harrison Hoffman came out saying, the new Xbox October update starts rolling out today, featuring lots of new goodies, including a fresh look and feel, profile themes, new signing experience, language support for Czechs, Greek, Hungarian, Slovak, performance improvements, and more. My God, more languages. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. So, additionally, you can change the color things to your menus. And since this new update, you can have the Xbox menu system displaying in either a light or dark theme, the latter of which is my personal preference, according to the writer of Games Radar. Or, but, uh, yeah, think of that or what you will, everyone, and look forward to that. Let's see if there's any more comic. Let's see if there was any comic news. Oh, Donny Cates' Dominates Advanced Reorders for Crossover Venom and Floor. So that's pretty cool. Now, oh, we get to the final bit of this video comic book collecting. As part of my addiction, because I have a problem and most likely need to be addressed with this, I have gone out to my local comic book shop, Third Eye Comics, shout out to them, um, and got myself a brand new stack of comics, all for the price of 47 bucks. And what to start this off with with spoilers, Death Metal 4, the art germ variant. Yeah, Green how John John Stewart Stewart Green Lantern. Awesome, awesome artwork. Loving Art Germs variant covers of this event. So awesome. This is so damn awesome. We got the Wonder Woman variant issue 764, or which is Joshua Milton, I believe. And pretty damn awesome cover look. It looks very high, um, hydroglyphic in the way it's presented, in my opinion. Also, Tom King's continued run on, on Strange Adventures continues. I got this more positive, uplifting variant, issue number 6 of 12. Oh, and... Yeah. I'm insane. Also, we get a rather somewhat controversial comic that got not a lot of traction. Rorschach. Let me just... Yeah, so this is the Warshack series published by Tom King. And some are saying this is the best work he's done since Mr. Miracle, which is telling. Uh, yeah, like I said, Tom King's a pretty busy guy. Even though he's not working on a series, he's working on, like, two projects. He's working on a third one, you know, Batman Catwoman, which is coming out in December, and I will be checking that out. So look forward to that, everyone. And that was uh, part, most of the DC stuff. There is one more, or, but that's safe for last because it's a thick book. Hellions, part six of the Exosword series. Marauders, part seven of the Exosword series. Cable, part eight of the Exosword series. And as you can see, I got managed to get the Alex Ross variant of, of Hellions featuring Jean Grey. So. Pretty, pretty damn awesome. I, that was the one variant I was looking to get. Also, for a companion piece, Exosword Handbook. The official handbook of this is collecting in documentary information regarding, you know, all the stuff regarding, you know, Exoswords and everything you need to know about the characters and whatnot for the lead into the event. Star Wars Darth Vader, Issue 6. And he's being tortured by Palpatine. That's fun. <laughs> and we got an image comic, Commanders in Crisis, which is by Steve Orlando, who worked on some Wonder Woman tie-in books that were set between between uh, the current run and uh, who was the other one? Uh, I, I'm not saying Jay Willow Wilson. I think it was her, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, yeah. It, so the villain writer Steve Orlando has a has a new 12-issue series, Commanders in Crisis, a tale of featuring several heroes who are survivors of the multiverse that was destroyed in a crisis event, it seems. <laughs> and I got the variant cover for this one because this is just awesome. In fact, there were some awesome variants, but I can only pick one, and I went with this one. And last but not least, we got a special one-shot, 80-page, short story, 10 short stories, DC Comics presents The Doomed and the Damned. Check out your local listing for this for this checkout. 
Also, I did check out some images on pages on here. Yeah, it does look like um it, it, I get the feeling they're teasing Raven and Beast Boy getting back together in this new in the new continuity. So I'm looking forward to that. I I, I love those two guys. Uh, he's in their bitter anger and and their love hate relationship. So yeah, those were all the comics I got this week. Look forward to the next week and probably a graphic novel or two. Ooh, and oh god, this is just gonna be awesome. So those were all my thoughts on on the piece of news in my collection of comics this week. This was Neo Reality Entertainment. If you like, comment, subscribe, and donate to for more. And thank you for 25 episodes of the collective of pop culture news talk.